Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Kim Brown in Baltimore. On Friday, the world's largest climate accord goes into effect. 94 countries have so far ratified the Paris Climate Agreement, which basically states that nations will do their part to ensure that the global temperature doesn't rise by above 2 degrees Celsius. But what will that compliance look like here in the U.S.? There are over 150 members of Congress who are climate change deniers, along with the Republican nominee for president. The White House, uh, should the White House fall out of the hands of the Democrats, control, will America's commitment to the climate agreement be abandoned? Now joining us from New York is Chris Williams. Chris is an educator, an author, and an activist. He is also author of Ecology and Socialism, Solutions to Capitalist Ecological Crisis, and the forthcoming book titled Creating an Ecological Society Towards a Revolutionary Transformation. Chris, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Kim. So, Chris, so explain to us exactly how the Paris Climate Agreement will work, because uh, I would imagine that each com country, rather, has their own responsibilities divided up in different ways, because uh, different countries have different amounts of output of pollution or carbon emissions, and different companies, uh, co I keep saying companies, I mean to say countries, different countries have different levels of technology to be able to comply with the agreement. So give us an example of how each nation's tasks are somehow different. Yeah, they are different. They actually have, they all have independently determined uh, national contributions, what are called uh, national contributions. And uh, they are assessed by the country. So whatever the country feels, the government feels they could do, they could sign up for that. And so that's clearly a drawback to say you're going to do what you want to do. And actually, the U.S. Have declared goals. So as, as are a number of other countries, some, some are, some aren't uh, on, on track to meet their commitments by 2030. But whether they are or they aren't, they're all voluntary. So um, there's no penalty if they don't make those contributions. And one of the interesting things that actually just came out today, the U.N. Uh, Environment Program released an emissions gap report uh, which states that the world is on track. If everybody does what they say that they're going to do, the world will heat up by three and a half Celsius, which is obviously pretty much double what they agreed to uh, do uh, and not exceed in Paris just a few months ago at the end of 2015. So even if you know the, it's going to come into effect tomorrow, uh, if they do everything they say that we're going to do, it will be to um, quote from the uh, the report by the UN a giant human tragedy, let alone um, planetary tragedy for all of the other species that will become extinct as a result of all the changes that will come about, uh, not just due, due to climate change, but also other factors in terms of biodiversity loss and so on. Well, Chris, I'm, I'm sort of reminded of the Kyoto Protocols that were signed in the um, 90s, and they were agreed to during the administration of President Bill Clinton, who was a Democrat. And as we transitioned from the 2000 election into the administration of George W. Bush, um, he rescinded America's commitment to the Kyoto Protocol, and the U.S. Um, eventually did not sign on to that agreement. And I'm curious as to whether or not we could be possibly seeing something similar with a possible uh, election of Republican Donald Trump, who is not only a climate change denier, but has said that if he were to become president, he would not allow America to take on the Paris Climate Agreement. So depending on the outcome of the U.S. election here, could really depend on America's level of commitment to this. Um, well, to a certain degree, but I would actually uh, change the definition of climate denier who is and who isn't. Yes, there are people who still don't believe in science, uh, which tells us, and the world around us, which uh, unequivocally is telling us that we are changing the, the climate um, very rapidly. And if, extremely dangerously. But I don't think that's really a sufficient uh, definition of climate denier anymore. I would say that the definition should be changed to anybody as a climate denier 
who is not taking the, the requisite action needed to avoid climate change, which means that all of those governments that signed up, the 192 governments that signed up for the Paris Climate Accord, which the UN tells us, every, all the scientists tell us, is not sufficient to avoid what they themselves are calling dangerous climate change, are, I would argue, also climate deniers, because we know what we should be doing. We also are capable of doing it, and yet uh, nobody has signed up for that. And in fact, even the weak pledges that they did say that they were going to do are not being followed by some countries, the US most notably, which is responsible for 25% of global emissions. So um, I think that that is an inadequate way of looking at things, really, from, from the perspective of science. And so uh, actually, if you, if you look at whether a Democrat or Republican has been better or worse, I mean, actually, oil production, fossil fuel production in the United States has doubled under President Obama. There's never been a faster rise by any president. So um, if Hillary Clinton is going to follow on from Obama, then I would suggest that we're going to see more of the same. And I think this is really the problem in general, that economic decisions are seen as separate from political decisions. So we can make all these political decisions, yet they seem to have no impact on economic decisions. So all the pipelines, all of the new coal plants, et cetera, are still being built. They're being built with the idea that they will be operating 50 years from now, otherwise they wouldn't build them. So nobody is taking the kind of decisions necessary to take climate change seriously. Um, so I don't think it makes any difference, really, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat in the White House or in Congress. And, and, and that's really the, the conundrum that many progressive voters have echoed, this exact sentiment that on one hand you have Donald Trump, who is a climate change denier, doesn't believe that the, the earth is warming, saying that global warming is a hoax of the Chinese. And you have, on the other hand, Democrat Hillary Clinton, who acknowledges that climate change is real and that it is happening. But as you said, she will continue with the policies of the Obama administration going forward with these pipelines and in embracing fracking as a quote unquote bridge fuel, which we know releases uh, tremendous amounts of methane into the atmosphere, which can be as damaging, if not worse, than carbon emissions. So mm -hmm. if you were to put yourself in the shoes of, of an American voting for president this time around and climate change and the state of the environment is a concern of yours, which way do you go? Yes, well, I think that there is a direction that you can go because, um, I mean, if you're choosing between somebody who denies the house is on fire and somebody who accepts the house is on fire but then chooses not to put out the fire, I think that that is hardly a choice if you want to save your house. So uh, if you want to do that, then I think the only real choice is to not vote Democrat or Republican and uh, vote for Jill Stein and the Green Party. I think that that is a, an actual difference. People will say, well, she can't win. Uh, well, I think it's also about how do we organize and prepare for the future. And the longer that we look to the Democrats to answer that question and do something for us, the more delayed we are in getting some genuine choice at elections instead of this horrendous nightmare that we're faced with between two terrible candidates, the most unpopular candidates in US history, for a very good reason, um, and actually have a genuine choice, which means real democracy. So I would say anybody concerned with environmental questions should be uh, campaigning and voting for uh, somebody in a party that actually represents something different, which is the Green Party and Jill Stein. I, we're not going to get anything from Hillary Clinton. I mean, she uh, is not only a warmonger, which is uh, one of the major causes of environmental destruction, not to mention, obviously, loss of human life, um, but uh, has told us that she has two uh, political outlooks, one for her friends in on Wall Street and another for uh, environmentalists and the public when she uh, is now recorded as saying, telling environmentalists us to get a life. So um, I think we will see a continuation of Obama's policies on all of the above environment. And she's uh, somebody who has championed fracking around the world and, and caused it to happen in other countries. Uh, she said nothing on the Dakota Access Pipeline of any value. 
Um, and that's because actually the oil that will flow through that pipeline, if they manage to overcome the immense and growing resistance, is uh, from fracking fields in North Dakota, which we shouldn't be do doing in the first place, uh, let alone building more pipelines. Chris, as you mentioned, that Hillary Clinton was a proponent of fracking, and she mm -hmm. um, was encouraging the practice of fracking in, in nations abroad. I know the UK just recently started fracking uh, for shale gas as well. Given this information, given that we're seeing this practice just using fracking as an example, um, are the, the metrics set forth in the Paris Climate Agreement are they going to be enough, even if all the countries come into strict compliance that, uh, for, for the, the guidelines that they've set forth for themselves? Is it still going to be enough to keep the global temperatures below the two degrees Celsius threshold? Well, it's not nearly enough. Um, I mean, we would have to radically change uh, how money is spent. We would have to reallocate capital, investment money, from fossil fuel projects to renewable energy projects. Um, and, and this would have a host of other benefits. I mean, in terms of, we know that hundreds of thousands of people, millions actually, are uh, their health is impacted by all of the pollutants that come into the air aside from carbon dioxide, from burning particularly coal, but other fossil fuels, um, gasoline, diesel. Um, there are a host of positive uh, impacts that you could actually spend less money on renewables than you're spending on infrastructure that is way out of date, horribly polluting, and destroying the biosphere. So, um, but you would have to do that. You would have to uh, reduce uh, defense spending massively because you want to re redirect that money from uh, killing people uh, and destroying the environment into protecting it. Uh, you would need to hire lots of people to build the new infrastructure that we need, which would obviously be a good thing, um, uh, economically speaking. And we'd have to think about uh, other aspects of uh, this constant growth that is inherent to capitalism, mo much of which we don't need, um, and other things that we could do that would be immensely beneficial for a whole host of reasons. We could be building the infrastructure that we need in the 21st century, rather than continuing to prop up this dirty, outdated, and um, inefficient uh, forms of power that currently exist. But to do that, you would need to take political decisions, such as uh, putting, not talking about emissions. I mean, this is the real problem with Paris, aside from its voluntary, um, aside from it, it incorporates things like offsets, which are, have been shown not to work. Um, it is um, talking about emissions uh, after the fact, as opposed to not producing it in the first place. So we really want to be talking about changing production, not just dealing with things after we've already produced the pollution. So you'd have to have a completely different way of looking at a totally different framework for analyzing. You'd also have to have, uh, so what we'd really be talking about is regulations, ways of regulating uh, corporations and government activity, which I think can only come from enhanced democracy, enhanced ability of the people to have a genuine say. Because when we look at polls, Republicans and Democrats in this country, in the United States, they want the government to take more action on climate change. They're aware of what's going on out uh, in the world around them. And so um, I think it's, again, about expanding the terms of the debate. Because if we look at the debates, that happened between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, climate change didn't even come up um, as an issue. And yet it is an issue for uh, Americans. So why isn't it being talked about by the people who are supposedly representing us? Because they don't represent us. They represent the corporations that pay their campaign funds. So uh, we, we have to look at a radical redistribution of social power if we're going to get the kind of changes in electrical power that we really need because also people are talking about well electric cars will be great no electric cars won't be great well if we want driverless cars they're called trains and buses and we should be producing that kind of social uh, answer to climate change in many many different realms 
Indeed. We have been joined today with Chris Williams. Chris is an educator, author, and an activist. He's also author of Ecology and Socialism, Solutions to a Capitalist Ecological Crisis, and the forthcoming book titled Creating an Ecological Society Towards a Revolutionary Transformation. Chris, we certainly appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kim. And thank you for watching The Real News Network.